Have you ever seen a super tomato before? They're pretty cool. All right, superfoods are really kind of overrated, honestly. Okay, because I think you can't say that one thing is a general superfood. In my opinion, there's foods that are superfoods surrounding a workout. There's foods that are superfoods perhaps for breakfast. There's foods that are superfoods for Y for Z. This video is about my five favorite superfoods that help with fasting. Foods that I think should be incorporated, whether it's during your fast or directly after. So without further ado, let's just jump right in and get to it. The first one is a weird one. You would never think that turkey would be a superfood, right? I consider turkey to be a good fasting superfood, after you break your fast, of course, or for breaking your fast. Specifically, when it comes to turkey, for slightly longer fasts, maybe 24 hours plus. Turkey is unique. Okay, let's get the basic silly stuff first. First off, it's lower in saturated fat. When it comes down to breaking a fast, lower saturated fat is generally better. There is some evidence that saturated fat is harder to break down, which, especially after a longer fast, is not exactly what you would want. Okay, as far as the microbiome goes as well, when things are sensitive and fragile after a fast, there's pretty decent evidence that copious amounts of saturated fat wouldn't necessarily be good for the microbiome in this particular case, right? I'm not saying saturated fat's bad at all. That's not my goal here. It's just when you break a fast, you want it as lean as you possibly can. Turkey, also very high protein for how much fat you're getting in in like a turkey breast as well. But that's not the real reason here, right? It's a Tom Stellar video. We go deeper than this. The big thing with turkey is it's extremely rich in phosphorus. Phosphorus is a very critical cofactor when it comes down to anabolism, when it comes down to protein synthesis. So at the end of a fast, the last thing you want is to not have protein synthesis. Okay, because you are in a catabolic state, meaning your body is teetering right on the edge of breaking down muscle. It's kind of what you want. You want to live on the edge. We live on the edge, right? We're hardcore. So then at the end of that fast, you want to be able to have protein synthesis go up so your body sucks up the protein you consume and rebuilds the muscle tissue or protects the muscle tissue from breaking down more. Phosphorus is imperative for that. Well, there was a study that was published in Medisa Clinica that took a look at just this. They found that during refeeding syndrome, which I'll explain in a second, basically after breaking a longer fast, that phosphorus was depleted. Subjects were deficient in phosphorus. Well, that's a problem, right? Because we need phosphorus for that overall protein synthesis. So one of two things happens. We either become so deficient in phosphorus that we don't really have as good of protein synthesis, or we do use the phosphorus that we have for protein synthesis, and that puts us potentially at dangerously low levels of phosphorus. This becomes increasingly more important the longer the fast, okay? So very important there. With refeeding syndrome, you have minerals that are going into the muscle cell because they're rushing in after you break your fast, leaving your blood levels a little bit lower in those minerals. Same thing with thiamine. Thiamine is very important, and turkey has thiamine in it. There's other sources that are richer in thiamine, but it's just to add insult to injury. You know, kind of playing on words there. Okay, so with that, the thiamine can help with the carbohydrate metabolism later on during your eating window. Moving on to avocado. Now, obviously not during a fast, but during your eating period, specifically at the end of your eating period, prior to maybe starting another fast. So the Journal of Nutrients published a paper looking at the satiety. Okay, they took a look at subjects that had a high carb meal or a meal with uh, half of an avocado or a meal with a full avocado. Well, the full avocado led to the highest degree of satiation, probably to the mechanistic action of increases in PYY and glucagon-like peptide, which are very powerful satiety signals, okay? So yes, we have that, but there's also some interesting stuff. Now, there's a study published in the journal Nutrition and Metabolism. Now, full disclaimer, it's a rodent model study, okay? I always say that because just because it's a rodent model doesn't mean it's 100% applicable in humans, but we've seen this mechanism many times in different sort of settings that monounsaturated fats like those that are in olive oil and avocado oil and avocados in general, okay, they can stimulate the expression of what is called PPAR gamma, which is the master regulator of fat adaptation. Fat adaptation is where your cells get better at using fats, adapted to using fats. Fasting gets you fat adapted, but when you're not fat adapted yet, it makes fasting difficult. That's why as you fast more, it starts to get easier because you get more adapted and your cells learn how to use the fat. 
and that's largely a result of the expression of PPAR gamma and PPAR alpha. So if we can potentially influence that to happen faster, you can get out of that beginner stage of fasting a little bit quicker and get to where fasting is just easy peasy, lemon squeezy all the time. Now we move into the next one, green tea during your fast. Well, after too, but I usually like to keep my caffeine allocated earlier in the day. So however that works out for you. Documented across lots of different journals that green tea seems to have fat loss benefits. I say seems to, even though the evidence is very strong, I say seems to because we cannot ever say with concrete yes or no that this is what's happening. But the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition back in 1999 had published a paper saying that 24 hour energy expenditure increased after green tea consumption as well as fatty acid oxidation. Very good news. Then 12 years later, there was a meta analysis that took a look at this as well as five other studies and did confirm that there was a high degree of confidence that green tea did increase energy expenditure and fatty acid oxidation. Mechanism, we're not 100% sure why, but it probably has something to do once again with what are called catechins. So when they took a look at green tea versus the same amount of caffeine in that green tea, but in a straight caffeine pill, they found that the caffeine itself didn't do it, but the green tea did have these effects. So it definitely plays a role there. Pretty interesting. My recommended green tea, by the way, is also today's video sponsor. It's called Ujido Matcha. If you're fasting or doing keto, they are awesome. They have these little on the go sticks. So you can like rip it open. You can have some matcha on the go. They have a sweet matcha. They have matcha with B12. So they have like an energy matcha. They have all kinds of cool stuff. But I think my personal favorite is just good old fashioned ceremonial grade, high quality matcha. This good quality stuff coming from a legit Japanese matcha company where the tea is grown in Japan. It's grown in the shade the way that it should be. So it retains that deep, rich green color and then it's pulverized the way that it should be. So you're not just getting like ground green tea leaves. You're getting true, legit baby green tea leaves that are grown in the shade with higher levels of that, that chlorophyll that makes them green. Cool stuff. Definitely want you to check them out. That link is down below in the description. So you can check them out after this video. Now, Ujido is the sponsor of this video. They're not making claims about fat loss or anything like that. I just want to make that clear. But when I'm fasting, I drink a lot of green tea and that's the one I use. So that link is down below. The next one is turmeric. Turmeric during a fast and also not during a fast. Okay. Yeah, there's some interesting evidence that turmeric could have fat loss effects, but I think the stronger evidence with turmeric is that in the world of being an inflammatory modulator. It, it modulates the inflammatory response via modulation of what's called nuclear factor kappa B. You like that word modulation? I say it a lot because I have to, because I can't say anything's proven or does this. I have to say modulate. So I like that word. It comes off a lot, right? Anyway, so that modulation of inflammation can make it better during a fast when inflammation is already quelled a little bit, but perhaps it can help you after a fast to potentially quell inflammation that might spike up after you break your fast. But more so than that, turmeric is interesting because it's what's called a fasting mimicker. It mimics the effects of fasting even when you're not fasting, which means that you might be able to carry over some of the cellular benefit. Okay, that means, you know, things like driving up AMPK, which, you know, if you know what AMPK is, I'll just leave it there. Also can induce autophagy. Autophagy is that cellular recycling we get when we're fasting, but it doesn't just stimulate autophagy by driving up AMPK more. It also stimulates autophagy via a secondary independent pathway, meaning it's quite the fasting mimicker, quite the autophagy inducer. So it definitely makes the list there. And then the last one is one that's perfect if you're doing shorter fasts, but you're worried about losing muscle and you want to maybe build some more muscle. You want to do it for body composition reasons. And that's good old fashioned fish. Okay. Fish is the next best protein. In fact, if you're doing shorter fasts, I would recommend fish. If you're doing longer fasts, I might recommend going with the turkey route. Here's the deal with fish. It's the omega three piece. Okay, we want fish that's rich in omega-3s. Now it's interesting because we used to think that omega-3s played a pretty powerful role in protein synthesis. The American Journal of Clinical Nutrition had published a paper saying that omega-3s did stimulate protein synthesis and potentially mitigated uh, sarcopenia. Well, that's okay. Then you look at study published in physiology reports. They looked at elite athletes. They saw there was no change in protein synthesis when omega-3s were at play. Okay, well, so that's kind of a you know, deadlock there. What do we do? Well, then we start seeing more interesting data. We originally thought that it would induce protein synthesis by phosphorylating mTOR. 
okay, mammalian target of rapamycin, which is what stimulates muscle growth overall, just muscle building, anabolism, protein synthesis. Well, that's a little bit inconclusive. More of the recent evidence demonstrates that it has more to do with cell membrane fluidity, making it so that a muscle cell membrane can potentially attract more in the way of the anabolic signaling. So hormones, whatever the case may be. They're saying that there is an increase in the amino acid uptake clearance. So meaning more amino acids are possibly getting into the cell because the cell is able to receive a signal from those anabolic signals better. So this is very interesting. If we have a more sensitive membrane, we have a cell that is more sensitive to signals and responses, which means in the critical moments after you break a fast or when your body has a small amount of time to really get nutrients in, the more that we can get a signal and take stuff up, the better, okay? By all means, still eat your beef, still eat your eggs, still this stuff. These I had to consolidate it into five fasting superfoods and there they are. I'll see you tomorrow.